Our final speaker this afternoon is uh, Mr. Alexander Kuzma, who is Executive Director of the Children of Chernobyl Relief and Development Fund. Uh, Mr. Kuzma has been working on Chernobyl relief for the past uh, 15 years, as, and as an example of his uh, dedication, he's just moved uh, to Kiev, to Ukraine, to, to work on these issues uh, uh, right at their source. So, Alex? He'll be talking about the, the role of non-governmental organizations like the Children of uh, Chernobyl. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hedwichuk. It's really a pleasure to join you today, and uh, I'm really grateful for the fact that uh, this, uh, the organizers gave me an excuse to come back to the United States for the first time since last August, so uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go off, in the interest of time, I'm going to go off script and I'm not going to be showing you any um, uh, PowerPoint presentations. Uh, we did distribute a um, uh, packet of, of information I'll just show it to you. Uh, for, for the sake of any kind of uh, visual framework, uh, there's additional copies of this uh, available to you. But the purpose of my uh, talk today is to, um, first of all, it's, my talk is based on the premise that uh, all of us are here today uh, because we're not just motivated by some kind of morbid curiosity about the impact of Chernobyl, but because Ukraine is very near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, these, uh, it's not an abstraction, this is our flesh and blood. These are people that are either family or could be family that were affected by um, Chernobyl. And um, we're also here because we're motivated by a desire to make a fundamental difference in their lives and a fundamental difference in the quality of treatment that these children receive when and if, God forbid, they're stricken with cancers, birth defects, or leukemias. Um, the Chicago community, like uh, much of our Ukrainian diaspora, I think often underestimates the power that it has to work, uh, to move mountains, and to make very fundamental changes in this part of the world. And I'm here to suggest to you that relatively modest investments in healthcare improvements can lead to dramatic results in the improvement of um, cancer treatment and in surgical interventions that can literally save not just hundreds but thousands of children's lives, whether or not the illnesses that these children are stricken with are ultimately determined to be caused by Chernobyl or not. That's a, almost a secondary issue. The most important thing is to recognize that Chernobyl was not uh, it was not a singular tragedy. It was accompanied by a second catastrophe, which is the virtual uh, collapse of the Soviet medical system um, that even preceded Chernobyl and had it not collapsed to the degree that it had, uh, we may have been able to save many more of these uh, children's lives. Um, when we started our, or when not, I didn't start it, I heard about the organization in 1990, um, I was amazed by the fact that within its first year, uh, the Children of Chernobyl Relief Fund had already executed three massive airlifts of medical supplies into Ukraine. I was curious as to what these people were made out of that they could, uh, in their first year of existence, organize something on this level. And when I was fortunate enough to meet the uh, organizers of CCRDF, I um, began to understand the overall strategy that, that uh, guided uh, their principles. Uh, these were people that were driven by a tremendous sense of urgency and an understanding that Ukraine really was facing a humanitarian and public health catastrophe if there was not a massive intervention in a very short period of time. Um, we understood that um, we could not afford to wait for an ultimate consensus from the public health community as to what the ultimate outcome of Chernobyl was going to be. We had to make some rapid, educated guesses about the uh, potential problems that would emerge. We tried to base, in the early years, uh, we based our assumptions on the post-Hiroshima results, which showed that the, in the first years following Hiroshima, as you saw in the charts presented by our earlier speakers, there was a marked increase in childhood leukemias and adult leukemias. So we decided to begin with that almost arbitrarily. Um, and we created, because at that time it was still the Soviet Union and we were not given access to um, uh, medical centers in, in Kiev or eastern Ukraine, we began in Lviv, even though it was not the most impacted community, but it was the community that was a hotbed of the, the democratic Ruch movement, the independence movement, and um, we uh, began working with a group of pro progressive doctors that created a model a hospital to combat childhood leukemia. Um, it's located on Nistroska Street, for those of you who are, are interested. And by developing a program of technology infusion and infusion of humanitarian aid, 
uh, we were able to um, develop a very effective um, hematology laboratory, a diagnostic lab that was able to, uh, first of all, pinpoint the types of leukemia these kids were being stricken with, and also to develop treatment protocols. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't use our American treatment protocols. They were more interested in the German protocols, but these were perfectly appropriate. And um, we saw in a very short period of time that the uh, recovery and remission rates began to improve. Uh, we were able to provide the first flow cytometer uh, to any hospital in the, in the former Soviet Union. Uh, we provided uh, blood gas analyzers, uh, blood chemistry analyzers, and uh, thanks to a, our first major grant from USAID in 1994, uh, we were also able to uh, provide a full protocol of chemotherapeutic uh, agents, uh, everything from Elspar, methotrexate, Oncovin, um, a whole range of the medications that were needed to treat these children. And we saw as the rates began to improve very radically from about a 5%, 10% recovery rate to over 68% now uh, for Hodgkin's lymphomas and 73% for acute myelogenous uh, leukemia. Similar results were achieved in our partner hospital in Kharkiv. We work with the uh, Kharkiv uh, City Children's Hospital number 16. Um, there again, when, uh, when we began our partnership, we saw uh, back in 1992 that the survival rates were about 5%. So it was a virtual death sentence for these children that were diagnosed with, with those illnesses. Um, at this point, it stands at uh, over 70%, uh, again, because they received key components such as um, a blood cell separator, which helps doctors to tailor their treatment to each individual child to isolate you know, healthy cells from, from uh, disease cells and so forth. So this was the first major uh, coup that our organization owes, uh, not just to the cluster of volunteers um, who plunged into this effort so zealously, but also thanks to the generosity of folks like yourselves who understood the vital importance of this effort and threw themselves into the effort uh, with, with a great deal of zeal and, and passion. The second issue that began to emerge was thyroid cancer. Um, you've heard a lot about that. I'm going to tell you just a little bit from an anecdotal uh, point, point of view how this issue became, came to our attention. In as early as 1991-92, um, Dr. Zenon Matkiewski, who himself is, was, was, he's now retired, he was the chief of surgery at Union Hospital, one of the hospitals in uh, New Jersey, which happens to have the highest rate of, of cancer uh, anywhere in the United States. I think New Jersey and Long Island have been have had the dubious distinction of competing for the highest cancer rate for, for the past 30 years. And in 25 years of practice, Dr. Matkiewski had seen one case of thyroid cancer in a child. It was a 15-year-old girl, and he remembered that um, basically the whole hospital was thrown upside down. It was, it was a sensation because, as I believe uh, Dr. Masnick mentioned earlier, uh, thyroid cancer occurs about once in a million uh, in, in children. It's that rare. And in one year, in 1992, during a visit to a hospital in Chernihiv, Dr. Matkiewski found 10 children as young as four and five years old with thyroid tumors, malignancies, you know, the size of softballs uh, on their necks. This obviously shocked him. It shocked the, the delegation that he was traveling with. And um, we decided that we had to take some action immediately. And this is, again, one of the critical roles, in addition to providing uh, direct medical aid, NGOs have a critical role to play in alerting public health agencies and government officials to public health um, problems uh, before they reach epidemic proportions. And so uh, because we had a strong chapter of CCRDF in, um, in my hometown and in, in, in Connecticut, we approached our senator, uh, Joe Lieberman, at that time and asked him if he would hold hearings so we could at least flush out these issues in a public forum and see whether what we were seeing um, had some, whether it was an anomaly or whether something was really developing into a worrisome pattern around the country. Um, at those hearings, uh, again, just as a little, little uh, uh, sidelight to all of this, um, we had several eminent doctors who testified at, at those hearings. Uh, there was a representative of the IAEA, Dr. Fred Mettler, who testified, um, and again, I think this bears mentioning because, uh, you know, in the Chernobyl Forum report issued last September, there was a lot of language to the effect that this was the most comprehensive, most authoritative study that, that, that compiled all the finest health literature available. At that time, Dr. Mettler, um, who was also one of the key spokespersons for the, for the um, uh, September 2005 report, testified that he had 
done, again, the most comprehensive that IAEA looked at all of the low-level areas, contaminated areas, looked at liquidators, looked at, at children in, in, you know, throughout Ukraine and Belarus, had found no evidence of an increase in thyroid cancer. Um, Lieberman pressed him on that issue. He maintained his position. Five weeks later, the report um, appeared in the Nature magazine confirmed by the WHO that, in fact, it was an 80-fold increase in thyroid cancer uh, confirmed by Dr. Kozakov and, uh, and Dmitryk. Um, so it just, it's a cautionary tale not to draw conclusions too early based on uh, self, you know, self-proclaimed um, uh, authoritative uh, uh, reports of this kind. But in any case, in this area also, um, we threw ourselves into this issue very quickly. Um, our fund provided over $2 million worth of thyroxin, which is a thyroid replacement hormone, um, to some of the critical areas such as the centers, uh, Center of Endocrinology in Kyiv. Uh, which was treating large numbers of these children even as early as, as 1992. Uh, Dr. Matkiewski and several of his colleagues helped to perform surgeries, thyroidectomies, on some of these children because it, you know, it's, there's, there's been a lot of mention that uh, out of the 4,000 children stricken with thyroid cancer in Ukraine that you know, only eight died. Okay, granted every child's death is, is very serious, but the, it, the fact that there was this international response, and we weren't the only ones responding this quickly. I have to say that the French, uh, there was a, uh, a French organization that did massive thyroid screenings. <clears throat> they looked at about 9,000 children between 1993 and uh, 9,000, uh, well, within a, a, a 18 month period. Again, helped to diagnose a lot of these kids at the point where their thyroid cancer was still uh, treatable and they could intervene quickly. There, there was a secondary problem, many of these kids uh, because the institutes of endocrinology had not done many of these types of surgeries, um, were they, they had problems in isolating healthy tissue. So they were mangling some of these kids' vocal cords. Um, I, there was a very sad uh, case of a, a beautiful young girl uh, I'd met. Uh, she was 14 years old, Anya Mospan in, in Kiev. Um, she was, she successfully overcame her thyroid cancer, but she was an aspiring opera singer. And by the time I met her, she had a voice like a 75-year-old lady, um, because they had, had uh, you know, uh, and and I can't blame the doctors involved in this. They they had to uh, intervene very quickly. But there was an effort on the part of um, Western doctors and uh, local doctors to provide quick training. Um, for uh, for the the surgeons to avoid those kinds of unnecessary that kind of unnecessary damage. Um, in other areas of cancer uh, treatment, again, there was not at that time a lot of evidence of any other kind of of cancer that was emerging. However, we figured that if there's an 80-fold increase in thyroid cancer, radioactive iodine 131 was not the only. Uh, element that was unleashed from Chernobyl reactor in massive quantities. So it stood to reason, whether it would be verified or not, that other types of cancers and hard, tum hard um, uh, solid tumors would begin to emerge. So together with Soyuz Ukraine Nokomatike, the Ukrainian National Women's League, we launched the campaign in 1993 to provide the first MRI unit um, for a hospital in, in Kyiv. And after a, a pretty arduous effort, we, we were able to uh, purchase a, uh, an MR unit for about one-third the cost, for about $350,000. The two organizations went in half and half, which is an example. You know, we Ukrainians often uh, berate ourselves for the fact that we don't know how to unify our, our efforts, and Mifsia Hechman, and, you know, we can't, we can't lie. Here was a great example of two organizations that probably were too weak to, on their own, to have purchased a, a, an MR unit. But together, we came together, we were able to get this unit. That unit, um, between 1994 and 2004, provided diagnostic screenings for over 11,000 patients, allowed for the um, early removal, uh, the identification of hundreds of malignancies and removal of those malignancies when they were still uh, eminently treatable. Um, and also, as a kind of a collateral benefit of all of that, um, the MR unit also, obviously, uh, we didn't want to just reserve it for Chernobyl-related illnesses. It also provided uh, valuable uh, diagnostic workups on traumatic head injuries, you know, a whole, whole range of other illnesses. So that um, this was just an example of how, by intervening, by following the, the, one of my favorite adages from Nike, which, which says, just do it, you're better off going ahead and delivering quality, um, quality medical care and looking at other potential benefits as, as time goes on. 
As far as the thyroid cancer piece, there's one other element that we feel is very important. There are now several thousand um, young women in Ukraine and in Belarus who in childhood uh, had their thyroids removed. We know that our whole endocrine system tends to be a delicate thing, and especially for women as they're preparing for childbirth, many of these, these girls are now entering their childbearing years. This is a very interesting area of research to look at um, any potential uh, reproductive um, imbalances or anomalies that may emerge as a result of that. And to, I think the, this cohort of, of young women really needs to be watched very carefully and uh, we need to look at whether there may need to be special interventions to protect them. Um, this is not an issue in isolation because, again, as early as uh, 1995, there were already two peer-reviewed studies, uh, one in Belarus by a woman named Dr. Anna Petrova under the supervision of uh, Dr. Nicholas Daniak and a team of doctors from uh, Yale Medical School that tracked women uh, who were living in contaminated areas of Rivne, northern Kyiv, northern Zhytomyr, com and comparing them to a cohort of women from relatively uncontaminated zones. And they found twice as many pregnancy complications, birth complications, birth defects among their newborns, stillbirths, hypoxia, um, acute forms of anemia across the board, very significant um, increases in those problems. And coincidentally, unbeknownst to the Belarusian team, there was a parallel study going on in Ukraine uh, developed by a team of doctors under the supervision of the Research Triangle. And, um, and actually, Dr. Hrochuk knows some of the, the doctors who were involved, Dr. Olesya Hulchi, Dr. Zurislava Shkiriak Nizhny, came here to Chicago, and we're very grateful for a lot of the training and insights that, that this institution helped to provide those women as they began to develop that, that study. And there also was evidence, although I don't, I'm not sure how, whether it was as conclusive, I don't think it actually um, resulted in a peer-reviewed study, but the, the Petrova study was peer-reviewed, it was published in Stem Cell Magazine, and there was a lot of evidence that, that there were worrisome results. And it's not surprising because we know from the early research in the 1950s by people like Dr. Alice Stewart that even tiny exposures to radiation can have a very damaging effect for an unborn fetus and also for a mother. That's why. Um, we stopped doing those kinds of uh, screenings using x-rays. It went from 52 million people to 47 million. Now, I'm not about to sit, stand here before you and say that this was, I, I can't even begin to guess whether Chernobyl was partly at fault or what portion of Chernobyl uh, aftermath or radiation exposure contributed to that, but I think common sense would indicate that that's not a normal, as Ukrainians like to say. This is not something you would expect in the absence of famine, war, pestilence. Um, it's something that's clearly worrisome and deserves, to, deserves a second look. But um, we, we did decide to do this kind of a, a campaign with um, neonatal intensive care. The other element was with birth defects. Um, again, the, the forum report from last year concluded there's no evidence of any kind of uh, genetic damage from Chernobyl. We find that very hard to believe because the several very credible studies using large cohorts of as many as 30,000 people have found substantially higher numbers of very rare birth defects that normally don't show up in even much larger populations. And I'll give you one example. Spina bifida, Dr. Uh, Volodymyr Vertelatsky, who many of you who are in the medical community in Umana know, um, this is one of the eminent geneticists in, in the United States, works very closely with using March of Dimes protocols. Dr. Vertelatsky, under a USAID grant, um, between 2001, I'm sorry, between the year 2000 and 2004, uh, began tracking every newborn in the provinces of Rivne, and uh, Volen, the two northwestern provinces. Um, in Rivne, there's about 14,000 kids born a year. In Volen, about 12,000. So over a four-year period, you're looking at 104,000 children. That's a pretty decent-sized um, constituency to look at. And he found that we're as in, uh, according to international standards, the rate of spina bifida is about three per 10,000 live births. In ac across these these two provinces, he found uh, nine. I'm sorry, 12 per uh, 12 per 10,000, fourfold increase, and these were all photographed, all documented. And beyond that, there he began more recently to look at the um, at the prevalence in the northern tier of the 
some of the rayon that the, the Dr. Zamostian was talking about, um, Rokitninsky, um, Zarichansky, that Polisian region, and found that there it was even more pronounced, um, that at, roughly at the level of 27 or 28 per 10,000, looking at, at uh, the, the overall numbers. Now, that's just one example. Um, there was another study in Belarus that was done uh, by uh, doctors affiliated with the Shigematsu group um, as early as 1994 that also found a lot of evidence of polydactylism, additional fingers and toes on, 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 a, on, on a hand or a foot, um, found cleft palates, et cetera. We decided there was no way we could tackle all of this, but one area that's been of particular concern for us is in the area of, of cardiac surgery. And with and congenital heart defects, um, Ukraine has about 6,000 children born per year with cardiac defects. 2,000 of those children uh, die within the first year, uh, usually because their conditions are not caught in time, um, and uh, also because there's just limited surgical capacity. The Amosov Institute in Kiev uh, was about the only institute in in Ukraine that did open heart surgery on on infants. And they did yeoman's work. I mean, we're looking at an institute that um, cranks out thousands of, of heart operations every year. They were only able to operate on about 380 children per year until a few years ago. Um, they've now doubled that number to about 680. But they clearly needed a lot of, a lot of support. Um, we felt this could have some relevance to, uh, to Chernobyl. And again, we're not passing any judgment on whether it does or not. But there, there are studies out there, um, just this week, uh, Dr. Steve Lipschultz from the University of Miami, who's an eminent oncologist and pediatric uh, cardi cardiologist, presented uh, very compelling evidence, both following Hiroshima and looking at children that um, under, underwent chemotherapy at a young age uh, in, in Florida. And the, they found some very interesting results that even among the children that, that uh, as they began to follow these children after they'd already fully recovered, um, they found that their heart muscle had been substantially weakened by uh, chemotherapy and that there was damage to, to the, the heart lining. Um, the rate of uh, sudden death, 50, 10 to 15 years out uh, in, that, in that group was about eight times higher than for children that had not undergone uh, chemotherapy. And these were peer-reviewed studies, um, so he voiced that alarm, and also Dr. Bill Novick of Tennessee, who has done a lot of surgeries on kids, uh, both in Belarus and in Ukraine, has identified several extremely rare forms of birth defects that normally you know, don't occur for, uh, at a higher rate of, than one in a million or one in two million, such things as uh, Epstein syndrome, that are showing up in much larger numbers in the Chernobyl um, constituency. So there's a clear need for at least support in this area. Um, we began to provide, uh, we, we also understood that Amosov alone was not in a position, you cannot have one cardiac surgery institute in the country that can handle all 6,000 kids that need these operations. Um, so we uh, began to look at opportunities to create other types of um, cancer, I'm sorry, cardiac surgery centers uh, we, with the help of uh, Victor Petrenko and the International Atomic, the, I'm sorry, the International Skating Community, uh, we were able to uh, set up uh, a uh, cardiac surgery wing in uh, the city of Odessa, which just last year performed their first 80 uh, open heart uh, operations on, on young children. Uh, we're also setting up a similar center in Lviv and in Kherson, and a team of doctors from Rivna are beginning to set that up in um, from most of us setting up a similar center in, in the Rivna. The most exciting thing uh, that came out of this is that by showing the degree to which we could increase the capacity of these cardiac surgery units, we began to put pressure on the Ukrainian government to step up its interventions. And three years ago, the Verkhovna Rada uh, allocated $7 million for the expansion of the Amosov unit. Um, and that is now, that's one of the reasons why they're, they're beginning to uh, be much more uh, much more effective. Um, the other area where we think that uh, a lot more can be done with the um, with all of our uh,
community organizations that are concerned about these issues is, for instance, I think, you know, Umana can play a very powerful role and we're grateful for the support of, um, you know, Mr. Kulas and his foundation and self-reliance here uh, in the publication of training manuals. We understood at an early stage that you cannot simply dump commodities, you can't just dump a sophisticated piece of equipment into a hospital and expect that doctors will know how to operate it properly. So we began to provide um, effective training programs, both in the form of national conferences, um, bringing in experts from the United States and Germany and, and other areas, but also through, uh, through uh, on-site training. Uh, for instance, in neonatology, we have a wonderful partner in uh, a young fellow named Volodya Mitin, who, um, it, in addition to selling us some of the best state-of-the-art uh, technology, is uh, uh, kind of the nanny McPhee of, of neonatal intensive care. He's, he'll come to the hospital, do detailed, uh, detailed training program, will harangue the doctors that, that are showing lack of uh, proper understanding of, of these issues. And he'll also travel if there's a, uh, if any piece of equipment breaks down, he's been known to travel from Kiev to Luhansk at two o'clock in the morning to make sure that that piece of equipment is functioning so that that child um, has the, the care that it needs. And the other, um, the other key element is providing, uh, even when we're not around or, or Volodya is not around to, to do this, um, to provide manuals. So just as an example, um, a couple of years ago we, we published this um, neonatal manual. Uh, in its original form, it was produced by uh, two of the preeminent uh, neonatologists from um, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, uh, Ann Stark and Dr. John uh, Clarity. And in just a, a short period of time, really within a, a two-month period, we had all 700 pages translated and peer-reviewed um, and published just in a two-month period um, and distributed to over 2,000 doctors at no charge all across Ukraine. We had to do a second printing uh, of, the, of the manual. And uh, every Friday we have swarms of uh, young medical students and doctors that, that come to our office and pick up these copies because the word's gotten out. The other, um, the other key element um, is, as Dr. Zamostyan mentioned earlier, is public information. We know that there is an element of this radiophobia and an eagerness to blame you know, a lot of health problems on Chernobyl. The danger is that even though a, a young woman, for instance, preparing for, um, to deliver a baby, she may not have any control over how much uh, radiation exposure she's, she's subjected to, but she can, she can certainly have control over uh, things, that, uh, things like cigarette smoking and uh, alcohol and making sure she's taking her prenatal vitamins, et cetera. And I was shocked, I remember when I came to, uh, when, as we began to expand our program to include uh, maternity hospitals and prenatal centers, I, I remember when my wife, uh, Irene, delivered our first baby, I mean, the first day that she found out she was pregnant, she came home with a stack like this of every conceivable, you know, prenatal uh, manual that you'd want. There was nothing like this anywhere in Ukraine. So we began by producing a, a very simple little booklet called Normal Navahitnis, again, not to overwhelm these moms with you know, a glut of information, but just the basic um, things that they needed to know about the development of their, their, their unborn baby, the kind of preventive measures they could do to at least lower the risk of, of any kind of major um, birth defects or, or complications. And here again, um, I think there's, there's no need for despair in the sense that there are positive steps that can be taken to protect uh, children against birth defects. For instance, I, I spoke about the high rate of spina bifida that Dr. Vertoletsky has been documenting, but we know, based on a, a vast amount of literature, that folic acid can really cut into the um, incidence of spina bifida. Ukraine does not, I think there's like 30% of the population in, in, in Ukraine has decent amounts of folic acid in their, um, in their diet. Um, and so we're going to be pushing uh, very hard for the Ukrainian government to insist on the integration of folic acid into simple foodstuffs, bread flours and pastries and, and that sort of thing. Um, so th that's one step that can be taken. The other key step is iodized salt. It's, it's criminal that in Ukraine, again, only about 25 to 30 percent of children have adequate, or I'm sorry, mothers have adequate iodine in their diet. Now, not only does that have implications for exposure to radioactive iodine, but it clearly has implications for 
the mental capacity and the IQ of children that are born, we know that there's at least a 15 to 30 percent decrease in um, decrease in, in um, intellectual capacity capacity for these kids. So there are very specific steps that can be taken, and we're pushing very hard to do that. And then the last area I just wanted to mention was um, given, I, you know, and I, I could talk about other areas, but I, we, we just don't have the time. So, uh, but just one other area that I know would be of interest to this community because some of your uh, native daughters and sons have actually gone to Ukraine to participate in this program. I know the uh, Tchaikovsky sisters, uh, Tanya and, and Oksana, uh, participated in this program. Um, Ukraine also suffered from the stigmatization of children born with birth defects. In Japan, after Hiroshima, these, they had a term. They called these children hibakusha, which was a term of outcasts, children that were not part of the mainstream. They were removed from society. And very late in the game, because again, our primary focus was on hospitals. We didn't really work with orphanages. But um, in the year 2000, again, just to show you what a non-governmental organization can do, or even one person can do to change the, the quality of life for a lot of people. Um, a woman named Teresa Gluch in, uh, in New Britain, Connecticut, uh, went to a, uh, couldn't make it to church at, a, at, uh, at her Ukrainian church, so she went to the Polish Kostol down the street and happened to pick up a bulletin that included an article with a headline called Chernobylska Umiralnia, which I understand in, in Polish means Chernobyl death facility or death camp. And as she read through this, she found out there was a tiny, there was, there was a, an orphanage in a tiny village in southwestern Ukraine, uh, like tam de dziecko kaže dobranich, literally, if you know uh, what I'm talking about, in the, the most remote possible place. There were 120 kids there with severe birth defects. They were um, living in s severely unsanitary conditions, uh, very poor food. Some of these kids were literally on the verge of, of malnutrition abusive uh, nyanke, uh, just uh, uh, as Kafkaesque a nightmare as you can imagine for children anywhere. And our initial response was, you know, we, we're spread too thin, we really can't take this on. But, um, you know, uh, uh, both Mrs. Gluch and uh, another woman named Nadia Haftkovich began to pester me every, every, <laughs> every week, like, when are you going to do something about that orphanage in, in Zalucha? That's outrageous. And finally, we sent an inspection. We sent a photographer, a fellow named Joey Savenki, uh, who's an aspiring young photographer. Um, he took photos of the conditions in which these kids were living. And the outrage that these photographs generated led Archbishop Antony of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the USA to allocate $40,000 for an overhaul of this facility and another one that we found in Kirovohrad Oblast in, in Znamyanka. We basically started from scratch, tore up the floors because they were literally contaminated with human feces. Uh, provided new mattresses, new new linens, a laundry machine because we were sick and tired of hearing the um, hearing the uh, orphanage director, who by the way was after we raised enough hell about it. Um, but uh, there was a uh, you know we basically said we'll provide you with the laundry machines, these industrial things, uh, cleaning agents, everything, and this one this just happenstance of this one woman finding this this little article. Um, has led to a situation where both of these orphanages have gone through substantial improvements. And there was a, um, I, I also would just want to say how important just the, per the personal touch is. Just even, with, even if you decide you, you don't have the capacity to, to go and be really involved in these programs, but just to go visit a hospital or to visit an orphanage sometimes can have an impact. And I'll never forget when uh, Archbishop Antony, with a delegation of 25 missionaries from the Orthodox Church, came to Zalucha in, uh, I think it was 2003, and I know Panya Mosnik was, uh, was on that expedition, and I'll tell you, it was earth shattering when Vladik Antonia came up with, to these children that were, were there with no arms or with, you know, with you know, mangled torsos or what have you, and embraced and blessed every one of these children. You could just see the look of shock and awe on, on the part of the caretakers. They never imagined that a child in this condition would ever be treated with this level of, of dignity and respect. And it created a sea change in the attitudes even of the caretakers for these, for these um, kids. So um, just to wrap up, um, I wanted to challenge this community. Uh, in Chicago, you, you folks are a real powerhouse, whether you realize it or not. You've got 50,000 people uh, 
as I understand it, about 50,000 Ukrainian Americans in the city of Chicago, or at least in the environment. That is an army that could move unbelievable mountains in the years to come. And all it takes is imagination and focus on one or two simple projects that you think that you can take on to make a difference in these children's lives. And um, I, I just want to say that I, I attended a lot of these uh, commemorative events this week. Um, our organization does not believe in commemor commemorations for commemoration's sake. We believe that the whole purpose for showing up at one of these things is to provide a catalyst for people to get involved, to roll up their sleeves, to reach deep into their, into their uh, uh, bank accounts, and to start thinking seriously about how we're going to save these children. As several of the speakers spoke said earlier today, we are very likely looking at the threshold of the next wave of cancers. I hope I'm, I hope I'm wrong. I hope, and, and I will you know, absolutely bow to our colleagues from, uh, from the Chernobyl Forum um, if, if they were right about the, their prediction of very small outcomes. I suspect they're not right, though. And I think the least we can do is to provide the medical infrastructure these medical centers need to combat these illnesses and to give these kids uh, a fighting chance. If we're wrong, no harm done. <laughs> we're still going to provide uh, you know, quality health care that, that all of us can be proud of. Um, and then the final, the final little um, image I want to leave you with is, again, citing uh, uh, an excellent uh, success on the part of a Chicago native, a uh, young lady named Michelle Polilka last spring went to Kyiv and uh, helped to organize a beautiful benefit concert uh, featuring the, well, she'd be offended if I compared her to Britney Spears. I won't compare her to Britney Spears. It's, uh, Ruslana is a far more intelligent person, uh, but Ruslana uh, uh, Lizhichko, who was the Eurovision winner, and um, uh, Michelle and Alexa uh, Melanich, a number of young ladies who some of you are familiar with from PLOST and SUM and other organizations, um, they put together a beautiful concert. Ruslana put all of her energy into it. And just five weeks ago, uh, we kept badgering Ruslana because she raised some significant money. And we said, Ruslana, we've got some beautiful neonatal equipment that we bought with the proceeds from your concert. You haven't even seen the fruits of your labor. Get out to Dnipropetrovsk and check this out. She also helped out two other hospitals in Lviv and Kyiv. And uh, Ruslana showed up um, unannounced. Uh, about a half, a half hour, she gave notice about a half hour before she arrived at the hospital that she was coming um, with her whole entourage. And uh, she was brought to, the doctors were very excited, they brought her to the neonatal station that she helped to finance. And uh, there's some beautiful photos actually in the booklet that we handed out today with her just leaning over this baby that was at that time the 36th child that had survived as a result of her, her care and literally understood that the air that was flowing into that baby's lungs came from her rock and rolling on that stage. She stayed for three hours instead of for a half hour, swore that she was going to uh, do more, ac more activities, uh, came back to, to Kyiv, organized a, a German TV crew that came out there, and then they organized a, a teleconference and a telethon in Germany that's now going to be supporting some of our efforts. Um, and all I can guarantee you is that if, if, you're, if, if the people in this room decide that they want to make that kind of a commitment and to see these kinds of results, um, we will guarantee you that we will bring you to those hospitals. And I, I just remember a couple of years ago um, bringing uh, Professor um, Volodymyr Bakum and his wife uh, to a hospital. This was already not, not six months after uh, they delivered the aid, but about two, two or three years after they began to finance uh, this one neonatal unit in Lutsk. And after they looked at the whole unit, which was named after Pani Oksana's grandmother, who had, who had uh, been a victim of the Stalin purges, she was a pediatrician who, who died in the, in the camps in Siberia. Um, so they first had the ceremony where they put up the, the icon to her grandmother honoring her. And then uh, Dr. Rudsky, uh, uh, the, the chief physician, said, we have a special treat for you right now. And he brought her upstairs to this little room where they walked in and a group of 20 toddlers rushed to, their, rushed to this little couple, started embracing their knees. These were the 20 children, uh, 20 of many children at that point. They raised, rescued about 82 kids per year with, with that technology. But 20 of the kids that were directly rescued by their efforts. And all I can say is that I would, I would wish all of you that kind of 
inexpressible joy and, and uh, tears of happiness that, um, that Professor and Mrs. Bakum experienced by, by seeing those kinds of results. I just think that this, this effort, you know, the kind of effort that we can launch is, uh, you know, it's worth every ounce of energy that we can pour into this mission. Thank you.